Good morning and welcome to India's Pora Tech Talk. Our fourth episode has been curated to introduce some interesting young Indian entrepreneurs from the tech space of Africa. India is planning to organize India's Pora is planning to organize events around South Africa's G20 presidency next year. India's Pora is a global network of Indian leaders from around the world who are committed to fostering and inspiring social change and becoming a force for good. With a mission to amplify the influence of Indian origin leaders in various fields such as business, politics, arts, philanthropy, India's Pora serves as a platform to harness the collective power of diaspora for a meaningful impact. Through our events, initiatives, and partnerships, India's Pora connects through thought leaders, change makers, to promote cross-border collaboration and create positive outcome in the realm of policy, education, healthcare, entrepreneurship, and cultural diplomacy. Introducing our moderator, Zach, who's the managing partner of Launch Africa Ventures, the most prominent and active early stage venture capital fund across Africa, with a portfolio of 150 plus ventures. Zach was also co-featured on Forbes Africa 2023 and was recognized as one of the top 10 most influential people in technology in Africa. Outside of his professional life, Zach is an acoustic guitarist and a vocation, vocalist. With cover album Give a Little 2010 and Human with Hearts 2018 on iTunes and Spotify and is currently busy finishing a work on nonfiction. That's an inspiring range of interests, Zach. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. Rahul. Rahul is the co-founder of CEO and CEO of Peach Payments, a leading payment gateway of South Africa. Kenya and Mauritius. He has worked with leading e-commerce websites and apps across Africa and spoken at numerous events, including Youth Pravasi Bharati Divas. He was named IESE Business School's Under 40 Entrepreneur of the Year in 2022. Sahil Afria is the visionary founder and CEO of Shipraiser a pioneer logistic technology startup focused on tackling distinct challenges of e-commerce and logistics across Africa. His work is driven by vision to revolutionize last mile delivery and become bridge between India, Africa trade. Thank you for joining us, Rahul and Sahil. And over to you, Zach, to take this platform to a great level. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And it's an honor to be part of the, the fourth episode of the in Diaspora uh, Forum focused on, on South Africa today, and hopefully the first of many more to come in the future. Uh, I'm going to start by just asking um, both Rahul and Sahil to do a very brief introduction on, on themselves and uh, their businesses, in addition to what we'd heard from, uh, from Nisha earlier, and then we'll get into some Q&A. So maybe Rahul, you want to go first? Oh, thanks, Zach. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rahul from uh, Peach Payments. You know, I, I grew up in Delhi, um, did an engineering in Bangalore, as we all do. Uh, and then I think about 12 years ago, moved to South Africa to start Peach Payments. The opportunity we kind of saw in Africa was looking at India and saying, you know, as the ecosystem evolves and develops, you know, there's a massive similar opportunity on the continent in Africa. You know, just to look at it, Africa today has 1.4 billion people on the continent. 60% of the population is below the age of 25. And digital commerce is only starting. So for us, it looked like a massive opportunity. And that's why we started Peach. Um, and that's why I've been here for 12 years. Very inspiring. We're going to dig more into that uh, shortly. Sahil, you want to talk, talk to us about your journey um, before sure. and then getting to ship sure, razor. No, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sahil. Uh, I came to South Africa first time in 2018. And since then, I've been uh, living in South Africa in different times and zones. And, and uh, I'm originally from Jaipur, Rajasthan. This is where I spent my childhood and then moved to Delhi and spent a decade in Delhi uh, from my engineering and worked with different startups. So throughout my life, I worked with only startups. Uh, and I only know and learn uh, the startup language. I don't know the corporate language too much. 
Uh, I came to when I came to South Africa, I saw so many similarities between our cultures in in India and Africa, the way people operate and and things happen. So I see foresee some some future and like a deja vu which I've we have seen in India and what can be built in Africa and and similar to to that uh, when I became I did my MBA from South Africa, so I also studied in Africa and after that I joined a VC fund and with that because of that VC fund I got an exposure to the startup ecosystem in Africa, and that gave me a clarity understanding of the similarities even within the opportunities between India and Africa, and hence so I started ShipRaiser. And ShipRaiser is basically a way to enable or manage end-to-end -end last mile logistics uh, within the continent. Uh, we started in South Africa and Kenya, and then also see how we can become a bridge between India and Africa for the trade to happen and provide the trust in between so that exporters in india can feel that okay things will be things will reach to africa safely so so you know so those kind of things so thank you we 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 are on a vision and and i'm really enjoying this journey thank you thank you sahil um before we get into the the, the panel properly i just wanted to um just say a few words about the work we've uh, we've done here so i i'm i'm the co-founder at launch africa ventures we're one of the most prominent early stage VCs on the African continent. Um, our first fund was $36 million. Our second fund is currently being raised at the moment. And in full disclosure, both Peach Payments and Shipraiser are investments that we've made. So there's no bias here. Um, and it's it's um, we, we, we see the technology and startup ecosystem in Africa is very similar to where India was about 10 years ago. So for every major South African or Kenyan or Nigerian fintech or edtech or health tech company, there are there are similar startups in India that uh, the founders here take inspiration from. Uh, and I think we'll get to that a bit later. But it's uh, for those that are listening on YouTube live and uh, who are part of this 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 um, this podcast right now, it's important for you know, two prominent entrepreneurs in the room and a VC to just share some of that background uh, because a, a, a lot is not talked about from an African tech perspective. And um, the purpose of these forums is to sort of debunk any myths that people have about uh, tech innovation in Africa. So, all right. So I'm going to start with Sahil. If you could tell us a little bit about um, what inspired you to leave India and come to, to South Africa. What did you see as a gap in the market, obviously you've modeled Shipraiser on 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 Shiprocket, but tell us about what made you start. You know what was the um, the you know the the pain point that you wanted to solve, and how did you build this product? Sure. No, thanks, Zach, for the question. And I think I will share a little bit of uh, personal side in the beginning. Yeah, how please. I ended up in how I ended up in in Africa. So I think I know one of the few which were where it was a complete risk. Uh, taking capabilities to move to Africa. It was not a job. It was, you know, not someone who like basically you know, funded my whole Africa journey in the beginning. So the so first time I came to South Africa was on my honeymoon and, and that was 2018 and I did a road trip of 3000 kilometers from Johannesburg to Cape Town, went to see all small to large towns in between. And I was running a startup back in India. It was called Mechanic Art. Uh, while I was on the honeymoon and I was as an entrepreneur thinking, oh, it was an automotive uh, space. And I was thinking, okay, South Africa can be a market for me. Everyone drives right inside, like same similar cars, India and South Africa, similar everything. So I thought that my honeymoon, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell my wife, but I would talk to a lot of people and see if, if South Africa can be a market. And I spent a lot of time while on that road trip. Uh, to talk to so many people uh, in in you know you know the people you are staying with in the hotel you, you people you are renting car with, so I've talked to so many people and realized damn I mean, there's a huge opportunity on this on this continent and this country to start with, and also it is beautiful uh, and it is the most amazing city to live uh, like Cape Town, so that was where a very important discussion that we started this whole journey uh, in the honeymoon from first day it was a 15 days road trip and towards the end of the 15th day my wife and i decided we will move back we will move to this country and we went back to india with that decision that we will move uh, so now the whole idea was starting on how do we move 
because I, I, in my understanding, there's only two ways to move to a new country. Either you are a son of a billionaire, so you can just move anywhere, or which I was not, or you go and be an Indian and go and study and then settle down there. So I chose a second route. Okay, then best way to do move to South Africa is to do MBA. And, and that's why, so the first time in my life, I saw the purpose of doing an MBA. Uh, before that, it was not really clear why people do MBA. So I came with a clear vision that, okay, MBA and why MBA? Because I need to network with everyone. So I literally Google rank one MBA college in South Africa, which ended up coming as top 40, 50 ranking globally, which was very surprised to see Africa have universities which are ranked under 50 uh, globally, which is like, it's quite ahead even compared to a couple of IAMs. Uh, so it was like perfect. So I gave an exam, GMAT, closed down my business, sold my inventory, used that money, came to South Africa and started studying. And I came with a just clear cut direction that I would, I would perform well academically, but I need to network with everyone in my college. So my college also have thankfully have the best network when it comes to the alumni network. And I reached out to everyone, made a lot of connections. And, and I think having those lot of conversation with local leaders through the MBA access, which I got on the continent, gave me an exposure of how things really works here. And, you know, the getting the opportunity in terms of a job. So my first job, which I got was with the VC firm. And the reason I was able to get the job, of course, my experience in entrepreneurship in India and all of that, but also the managing partner of that firm was also my alumni network. So this is how, you know, the, the universe also conspired to like, okay, you, you're taking these risky decisions, you're moving to one direction, taking, you know, and then you're creating those kind of opportunities around the people you are building that trust among the people. So all of that gave me a lot of exposure. And then one thing leads to another one, uh, that we see experience and uh, working with multiple startups locally gave me detailed clarity between the similarities and the differences in the Indian startup ecosystem and the African startup ecosystem. And that's where I, and I've been following Shiprocket journey for many, many years since the beginning. So because I was in India, 2014, 15 startup, and that's the same time Shiprocket started. I've been, I've been seeing how they have done. I have my family members in India who use, who, who are like big D2C brands and they use Shiprocket in India. So like, how do you ship it? So I already had a lot of understanding and clarity on the logistics side. And I born and brought up in a logistic family. We are nine cousins out of nine, eight of them are in logistics. I was the only one who was not in logistics and I ended up in logistics now. So, so I, I think it's, it's also universe roles a lot, God's plan a lot, uh, but uh, my experience in technology, uh, being a computer science engineer, experience in business uh, and understanding of logistics made it properly clear that this is where I would need to go. And I was, I was convinced that Africa time is coming and I'm going to be here for next 10, 20, 30 years. I'm not going anywhere. And this is where I need to build businesses. Hence I resigned and then I started Shipraiser uh, with the playbook, which has already, already been played by Indian players. I just have to really understand and go deeper on how does it really works well in, in the Africa landscape. And, and since then I'm executing and all the stories you guys know. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you, Sal. Very, very inspirational journey. I mean, from a road trip to then starting eventually one of the biggest uh, or at least fastest growing logistics platforms on the continent. Rahul, if you may, similar uh, uh, just lay of the land. You mentioned, you know, studying in India and then moving here eventually. Yeah. It wasn't an MBA, but tell us about your journey, about how you started Peach eventually. So, um, Sal, there's a third reason why you can move to another country, right? Which is to start a venture directly. <laughs> um, so, I, so, you know, as I said, you know, I did my engineering in India, then worked in India for National Instruments for three years. Um, and then decided to do an MBA for which I went to ESA in Barcelona, IESE Business School. And between the first and the second year, we typically do a summer internship. So I did that with a boutique VC fund in Pretoria in South Africa. So I actually came to South Africa in 2009 for three months on a summer internship and met a lot of people in South Africa. From there, I went on to Sloan at MIT in Boston, finished my MBA, ended up getting a job in strategy consulting in Boston. So lived there for two years. And then some of the people, you know, one of the guys I met in South Africa called me and said, Hey, do you want to do payments in Africa? And I, you know, I was at that time itching to do a startup. 
I was working on a travel tech startup with my roommate in Boston. And then I said, you know what? I don't have a better idea. Um, here's an opportunity to co-found a uh, payments uh, business in Africa. I think payments is the infrastructure layer for all digital commerce in general. And it sounded like a great opportunity. You know, when we started Peach, so I, I say I effectively in, I think it was May 2012, I quit my job, took packed up my bags, took a flight and came to Cape Town. I had never been to Cape Town before. I had met this guy only for three days, uh, two years, before, yeah, three years before that. And, you know, here we were co-founders starting a payments business in 2012 in Africa. Um, the, as I said, I think Cape Town was a big factor. You know, it's one of the best places to live on the, um, actually, I think on earth. And it's one of those cities, you know, there are a few cities that really uh, inspire, you know, tech ecosystems. Um, you'll see San Francisco, New York, Boston, you know, Bangalore, there's few hubs. And I do believe Cape Town is going to be one of the big hubs for entrepreneurship in Africa, along with Lagos and a few other cities. Um, so yeah, so I moved to South Africa and then, you know, as they say, the rest is history. Slowly, slowly, we started to build the business. I think for us, again, the inspiration was really around looking at Stripe, Braintree and saying, you know, that was the time when these started to take off and really scale in some of the more mature markets of Western Europe and North America. And then the idea was, you know, Africa is a white space. I mean, yes, there were PS payment players on the continent. When I came to South Africa, there were 10 different players in South Africa already. You know, today we're the second largest player in the market. We have gone, we are now in four countries in Africa and hopefully in the next 12 months, we'll be across 10 to 12 countries on the continent. So it took a bit of time to establish, to understand Africa, to understand, you know, because payments is an interesting space because it's locally regulated. I think what people forget is Africa has 54 countries, you know, and, you know, well, another interesting fact is you look at the map of Africa, you know, globe world map. You know, these Mercator maps are quite distorted, right? Like it looks like Africa is smaller compared to some of the other continents, but you could fit, I think, India, China, and most of Europe into the landmass of Africa. So it is it is crazy how big the continent really is versus what you see on a map, right? And it's 54 different countries on the continent. So I think the challenge of Africa is understanding the socioeconomic, the cultural context of each of these countries, because it changes drastically. You know, it's like India, honestly, 31 states, 32 states, and every state is different. You go from Bangalore to Chennai to Hyderabad, language changes, cuisine changes, culture changes. You go to, Zach, you, know, you mentioned you're from Kerala. Like, again, completely different language, completely different script, completely different culture. And I think that's a similarity for us except Africa is not one market. You have to solve for 54 markets one by one. And I think there's some effort around that. But I think that's also the opportunity. The people who can solve for 10, 12, 15 of the most important markets on the continent will build massive businesses. Yeah, and I think that's what was our thought process when we started Peach, is that we, from day one, we were very clear. We're not going to be just a South African player. We're going to be a Pan-African player. And I think that's kind of the journey we are on. A speech yeah absolutely i mean it's it's um it's as i say africa is not for sissies there's um there's quite a lot to do here and 54 countries is a massive challenge it's funny how the the population of the entire african continent is similar to india but we've got um different languages different rules of law english law french law sharia law um, but interestingly enough, Africa is a lot more homogenous <clears throat> because of, sadly, because of co uh, colonization. It's, uh, it is easier to scale within an English-speaking African country from Nigeria to Ghana or from Senegal to Cote d'Ivoire because of legacy systems. And people often talk, for example, about currency volatility and geopolitical issues. But one of the, one of the things we have realized as a VC is the, the stickiness of revenue in Africa from a tech perspective, is a lot higher because people don't have a lot of other options. So if you go with one payment service provider or with, you know, one insurance provider, you don't have 25 others to choose from like in India or in, you know, 
the US or Western Europe. So it takes a lot longer to achieve product market fit, but once you achieve product market fit, the the recurring revenue is um, is quite attractive and lucrative. So, okay, so um, just you know, people. I mean, people, you know, all all of us here are from the Indian diaspora. Moving into a different country or a continent is not easy. So maybe <clears throat> between the two, you, I'm going to start with Sahil. Could you talk to us about some of the the biggest challenges you faced as a foreigner? coming to South Africa, building a product from scratch, were there trust issues you dealt with saying, why are you coming to South Africa and building this? What are your intentions? Um, just some of the things that people listening here would, would be curious about. You know, it is, it, it is quite a leap of faith to go to a new country and build something from scratch, right? People question your intentions, regulation, even things like visas, for example. So for our listen for our listeners here, what is it like as an Indian to come to South Africa and start from scratch? Just give us a little bit of a perspective. I can give you mine later, but maybe Sahil, you wanna so, no, share? Thanks, Zach. This is quite a emotional topic. Uh, so I think I think it, it's a lot when you move to a new country or new place, a lot to do is also about uh, your mindset. And is also not just your personal mindset. Then it also gets shaken and 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 moves by your 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 family, right? So first of all, let's talk about from the idea of thinking of moving to Africa. So first thing is your 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 family would say you moving to like in India, everyone wants to move to US or Europe or Australia. I think if I just club all these three as a destination, most of the Indians just moving in these three three spaces, right? And then if you tell your family, your parents, I'm moving to Africa, they, they don't understand it in the beginning. So first, first resistance would come is from within your family, or mostly, uh, you know, the, the cultural aspect within the Indian Indian context. Oh, your, your son is going in US. It has changed a lot in past many, many years, but it's still, if you see like middle class as an Indian as a category, if you say you're going to moving to Africa, they will they will not really look at you as, as sure, a, you're yeah. doing something crazy amazing. You look at it like, are you sure? So so that that is the first doubt you you will you know just say like no, you don't worry about it. And when you move to really Cape Town, you come to South Africa, especially you will see people don't know anything about it. Like literally, there's a black big mind blocker when africa as a terminology comes in the mind of people especially from the indian indian perspective because this is where we are born and birth that that was the first thing but then let's talk about moving to to south africa i think one of the best thing happened to me apart from my mind was uh, being an indian in on this continent i think it's like i thought i genuinely think that being an indian helped me more than anything else like i was i'm very easy like we born and brought up in india and we have this understanding of that we are so culturally diverse acceptable acceptance for culturally diversity is is like we we, we grew up with so we accept it to a very deeper level uh, especially my generation right so when I come to South Africa, like it's very easy for being an Indian to have really good friends with white people, very good friends with like from different racial, uh, you know, ethnicity is very e good, easy to, uh, you know, work with color people, very easy to work with black people. So, the, so there are different diversity, racial diversity in itself in Africa and especially in South Africa is too much. So it's very easy to be among everyone, right? Compared to the, the, for others. So, so from, all genuinity, like I think it helped me a lot, in fact, culturally, to be able to understand all different racial backgrounds of people, to be able to work with them. And and I think Indians have, uh, especially Indians, have created this, this mindset globally that we are smart people. And I think that also helps a lot. I'm, I'm just being very, very absolutely honest. Yeah. And like, I, I've seen that when the Indian people say something in Africa, people listen. Like, of course, if you are smarter and educated and then you're talking something and you're Indian as a, as a, as a joint factor, then people listen more. So we literally, like white people, what uh, in 19th century was, uh, was white people were, you know, so, so I could, I could yeah. sense that. So I think it was good. But the most challenging part was uh, twofold. One was admin. The visa challenges are, it's not like Germany. Germany tells you, you will get response in two months. 
it, you will not get response in two months in, in Africa. You will, you don't know when you will get response from. So you are playing, you're creating businesses. You, you need to solve your visa problem. Are you even allowed to be in the country or not allowed to be in the country? Thankfully, one of the fortunate ones to able to get the permanent residency, we were able to sort it, but it was not an easy journey. I was 10 times ahead than my lawyers uh, for visa to be able to make sure that I will get my visa. Uh, the, the mental power, the thinking required to get your visa sorted uh, was very different. Uh, uh, so now, thankfully, everything is sorted. That was a one big challenge. The second big challenge was that when you move to a new country, you don't have a lot of friends. I studied here, uh, so I could make a lot of friends from my universities and stuff like that. So my wife is very, very difficult. So there was no, uh, like so you move to a new place, there's no, you know, many people you know, and it's very difficult to, it's different energy to make friends when you are in college or in school. Those kind of friendship doesn't happen after you cross your thirties, right? So I think, I think that some of those have, have those people around you where you can call, you know, the one cultural shock was, in South Africa, in India, you have a habit of calling randomly to your people. Like, you know, in South Africa, you ask, can I call? <laughs> Which was very different and new for me. And then you call. Like, in India, you can just call. So, so some of those those things, which I, I think from personal aspect in terms of your family and then making sure that you, you're not the only one. You also have a life partner. You also have kids. And they need to be feel comfortable and have people around them so that you can go and build the business. So I think that was the biggest challenge. Apart from that, everything was pretty <clears throat> amazing. Got it. Yeah, before we get into technical questions on both your products, Rahul, just a similar question about some of the challenges you felt coming into South Africa and how you overcame them culturally, mm -hmm. socially, economically. Super helpful. Sure. Um, you know, I think let's start with the, the business side of it, right? Like I think one of the biggest challenges when you move to a brand new country or even continent and start a business, I don't think you have the existing networks that you have, right? And I think Sahil was alluding to a little bit of that. So let's say my background was growing up in India or, you know, I was, my entire schooling life was spent in Delhi. My entire undergraduate was spent in Bangalore. I worked between Bangalore and Delhi. I still know hundreds and thousands of people in those cities and, and in India in general, you know, Ship Rocket, uh, Sahil, not this Sahil, the other Sahil, and I went to school together, right? Um, so we, we, we have those networks there. When I landed in South Africa, you're like a deer in, you know, the headlight, headlights because you don't know anybody, nobody knows you, and, you know, you're starting from scratch. So I think for PH, building credibility was a big challenge. You know, in South Africa, back in the day, four banks, five banks. It was an old boys club. It took us a year to get the first bank to agree to work with us and to allow us to launch our product and service. <clears throat> so over the past 10, or over the past decade, now everyone knows speech in Africa. You know, any bank you speak to, any senior executive you speak, but it's taken 10 years of hard work to build that credibility and that reputation that, hey, we want to work with Peach. So I think that's hard. Um, you, even as you're building your business, again, those networks, you don't know enough people, you know, Sahil at least did his MBA here. So probably met a lot of people, but you land here. Now you need to build a team. Who do you hire? How do you know who is good? Who is not good? How do you even find people? So even recruiting was very hard for us, you know, back in the day. Now, again, you, it's network effects. You know, today the peach team is about 200 people spread across five different locations. And we are able to attract talent based on our brand, based on people who already are part of our team, who use their networks to attract even more people to the team. But that early days of building that first 15, 20 people team was, was quite tough. Um, and I think for us, like those were some of the hardest challenges. And then honestly, the product and the pro service started to speak for itself. You, you sign one big customer, it becomes a lighthouse, you, you grow from there. Um, on the personal side, you know, social challenges, you know, again, every city is different. I felt the US was a lot more assimilative. You know, it was a lot easier for me to land in Boston, start working there and make friends and then be part of society on day one. I think in Africa, some of that doesn't assimilate as easily. Um, even after 10 years, 12 years, I'm still an expat in the city, right? And I think, I don't know how you've, experienced that but that's something 
uh, that that does take a toll. Um, so the social element is harder. You know, I joined Entrepreneurs Organization EO. Through that, I met a lot of people. So there are a few ways. And then through work, through Peach's work, you know, we know a lot of people now, right? But those are not friends. I think one of the things we've decided is the cost of living in Africa for us is that we hop on a plane and go back home uh, a few times a year because we are missing out on all the family events. We're missing out on all the, you know, close friends and family and that as aspect of life. So last week I was in Mumbai. In two weeks' time, I'm back in Delhi. Uh, that's part of what I've decided is the cost of living in Africa for me. So I think uh, to Sahil's point, I do also agree that being Indian is a competitive advantage on the continent. I think there's a few factors. I think what's happened for the Indian diaspora uh, over the past decade, you know, the general stature of India has increased um, globally, whether it is, you know, through the work of the existing government or what the diaspora has been doing as individuals, you know, today Indians are respected world over. Things like UPI, at least in the payment space, you know, people read and hear a lot about that. So again, there's this halo effect <laughs> where people, you know, you get that credibility by association a little bit. And I think there's also what people don't realize is that Africa has had a large Indian diaspora for the last hundred years. I mean, you go to countries like Kenya, Uganda, even in South Africa, there are Indian families that have been contributing to local society that have been building massive traditional businesses for the last hundred years over here. And because of that, there's a lot of respect for Indians across Africa. So, you know, as we went from South Africa to Kenya, I used to be traveling to Nairobi. I have tra you know, I would go to Lagos. I go to Mauritius. It's a competitive advantage being an Indian because of what the diaspora has done over the past century on the continent. Yeah, no, it's a very, very, very good point. Um, just a, a couple of technical questions that I think our audience members would love to hear. Sahil, could you talk about the 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 product that Shipraiser has built? Obviously, it's relatively new. It's just just around a year, maybe just slightly over a year. Could you talk about what problem Shipraiser is solving? Um, how you started to build it? And also just talk about some of the, the technical features that Shipraiser has versus what other last mile delivery companies in South Africa don't have. And maybe talk a little bit about your expansion into Kenya as well for, for, for those that are curious. Sure. Perfect. No, thanks, Zach. I really appreciate it. So Shipraiser, as I mentioned previously, uh, as, a, as a summary, is an end-to-end logistics management platform. So when I say end-to-end -end logistics, then from the e-commerce businesses perspective, there is a boom of e-commerce uh, in South Africa and also in Africa. The year-on-year the -year growth is, is more than 15%, uh, around 15%, which is happening. So next few years also, we're going to see Amazon launch, uh, you know, earlier this year in South Africa. So a lot of things are changing and the maturity in terms of logistics has to be there. So overall, it, it, like payment sets the base for an economy, then e-commerce goes up. As soon as e-commerce goes up, logistics has to catch up. So literally this is a general trend globally and this is what is currently happening here. So the logist from the logistics perspective, what we really had to build was there are people because there was not clear uh, logistics uh, companies here. They have their own fleet, right? And it's very difficult for them to think, okay, I, I don't want to use my fleet. I want to use a courier company. I want to use a transportation company. So they have their own fleet. So there's a transition period for them. Then people who would be who are shipping hundreds of products every day, but then there is it's all manual. It's, it's very difficult to manage it. There is difficult to see like which for which particular parcel which is going in different cities what should be the cost so or cost at the order level at the product level that is the second thing how we can get it delivered cheaper and efficiently and tracking and all of that the third thing is okay so africa is of course 54 countries but there's a general trend which we have seen africans export a lot uh, and also import a lot so apart from local domestic there is an important export as a as a function of their division mostly mid mid businesses have this so now same business have their fleet, same business wants to use courier company, same business wants to do import, same business wants to do export. So it's 
one one same business who is well known brand can be let's say Levi's or anyone who's doing all of these things, right? So now on our platform, what you're able to build is that okay, you can digitize your own fleet, you can give orders to your own driver, your own truck, your own bike. Then you can choose. We have integrated more than 15 courier companies from the likes of Aramex, FedEx to DHL to Uber, Bolt, you know, to all the local courier companies which are specialized in Kenya, specialized in South Africa. So we have more than 15 courier companies to choose. In the same platform, you can export. So also export is happening door to door. So you can choose, you can see FedEx and and Aramex as an as an option right now to do the export. And we are also eventually now building the capability to really understand from to start with from India and Africa perspective is the import capability, ability to get lending cost in South Africa, ability to get uh you know the even the margin at the product level at the so if you let's say importing 50 items and what should be the margin for each every what will be the lending cost for each product level you will be able to calculate on our on our platform so now from you really think it's logistics it's literally end to end logistics so uh our, our features and and some of the so no there's no not a single correct platform which exists which can do all of that not a single uh so from the from the competitive edge perspective from our competitors uh, it's going to take a lot of time for them to build and thankfully we have quite smartness in terms of our tech capabilities which we have in-house uh, so like we can deliver 60 minutes we have uber integrated bolt integrated you know those kind of bikes so we have the largest bike network because of that in the country then we have the largest courier network uh, in the, in the country because of the all aggregation then you can use your own fleet then you can export then you can import so all of that as a, as a, as a sum is is what we have uh, very unique on our platform and then buying insurance so this is a basic layer then ability to buy insurance on the order level this is where we are going now so now let's say you're shipping something and you're shipping an expensive phone is going to an area which you believe not very safe and you want to have an insurance on it because it's expensive iPhone you're delivering, right? So you can buy the insurance of the platform. So some of those extra capabilities which we are building and currently there's not a single platform which provides all of that on one platform. So businesses will have to use multiple uh, platforms to do it and be growing very rapidly. Every month our revenue almost growing 30 to 40 to 50 percent in some of the months it doubled as well uh, so we have seen from january to literally in september we have seen 25 times growth overall 20 20 20 25 times growth overall in terms of our revenue so even though we are very young and new uh, within one year as zach mentioned but the growth is tremendous i mean and i'm and i'm really thankful to also friends my friends on the continent rahul and zach like both we, we all are playing some role in each other's business. Peach Payment have the customer base and we have the customer base, the same customer base. So now we go really deeper with Peach Payments, with Rahul's company to really see how do we really offer something which has payments and logistics combined, right? So the same customer base again, the e-commerce, they need both things. So how do we do it? How do we club it? What kind of data product capabilities which we can build for e-commerce businesses where they don't really have to which makes their life easy. They don't really have to think anything because you really, really need three things. Getting the products online, able to receive money and pay, pay money, even between countries. So features, which Rahul will share with the partnership with UPI and all of that. Able to get the money in and out, then able to get products in and out. So if I can sort, able to get products in and out and everywhere, Rahul can sort, able to get money in and out, people are growing anyway. So I think then the, the story ends there. So, so yeah, so, uh, some very high level uh, capabilities and and you know and and strategic direction towards where we're going yeah no this is super helpful Sahil. thank you so much for all that clarity uh, we have a question from from one of the audience members and i was going to ask it anyways this is for rahul talking about um i mean for those for those of us you know listening from india um from a from a payments perspective, Africa is still very much a cash economy, cash, and more recently over the last fifteen years, mobile money. So when you're working with card payments, how do you, you know, how do you how do you see online and in store payment capabilities competing with cash? I'm sure you get asked this question a lot. 
And what can a, a PSP like Peach do to alleviate this cash challenge and turn it into opportunities? Maybe a bit of a landscape and background would be super helpful. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, what, as I was saying earlier, you know, Africa's 54 different countries. And what you'll realize is how people pay changes across each of these countries, you know. Um, so from a consumer behavior perspective, you know, what are the payment methods people are using? What stores of value? It, it changes, you know, so there's like South Africa as an example, heavily banked market, 70% of the transactions are using cards versus you go to Kenya where 90% plus transactions are done using M-Pesa, which is a mobile money wallet. Um, when it comes to cash, yes, cash is a big part of, um, you know, the markets, but I think it's a journey that every country and every ecosystem will go through as we convert from cash to cashless. So, you know, I was at GFF, which is the Global FinTech Fest last week in Mumbai, and Prime Minister Modi was there and he, you know, he gave a speech and he mentioned one thing where he said, a decade ago, India was cash is king. Today, half of the world's real-time transactions happen in India. And it's been a systematic effort by the government, by the ecosystem. And it's taken a decade. To, to get to the point where UPI is so per pervasive and people are so used to paying with their apps and QR codes. So I think this is also a journey that will take different forms of, in different countries. As a pay, PSP, as a payment gateway, you know, we are agnostic to how people want to pay. We, we want to make available all the different payment methods. So in South Africa, we offer 12 different payment methods that, you know, different stores of value, loyalty schemes, et cetera, that consumers are using. In Kenya also, we'll integrate whatever is locally relevant. We've got Mauritius, we've got, you know, Iswatini, we're looking at Francophone Africa. So I think our strategy is to say, how do people pay digitally and how do we make that available across more businesses? So you create that snowball effect. You start to enable more businesses, more merchants to accept these digital forms of payment. And slowly consumers will find that convenience, you know, addictive and start paying more digitally because no one wants to carry cash. They're forced to carry cash because someone doesn't accept their wallet. Someone doesn't accept their form of payment that they prefer. You know, change is a big hassle. Today in India, if you're carrying cash, you can't pay anywhere because no one has change. Right. And I think that's the journey. That's what will happen across Africa as well. But every country will be at a different pace. That's kind of how I think about cash versus digital. I think the one thing that's very important in Africa, what people don't realize is we are skipping, we are leapfrogging technology over here. Right. There are no fixed lines. Everyone has a cell phone. You know, today across the Peach platform, 70% of transactions are done on a mobile device, not on a desktop. Right. And I think these are some of the facets or features of Africa where, you know, because we come to the party a bit later, we can adopt the latest technology. And that's what's happening from a consumer behavior perspective. So I think you'll see a steeper J curve in that adoption as, as people start to go digital, you know, and there's a lot of digital native users that are coming in, you know, because it's a young population. So I think that transition that we'll see will be a lot faster in africa we're still the infrastructure is still getting built and that's really what's exciting is we can be part of that infrastructure got it got it um and for and for sahil from a logistics perspective um there are conceptions around how difficult infrastructure is in africa people take for take for granted things like trucking logistics courier deliveries how does how does ship raiser specifically address these issues through through to through, through tech i mean are there any you know innovative tools that ship raiser has that that gives you a special advantage over other platforms could you talk about a first of all take a step back is is last mile delivery a real problem in africa or is it a nice to have solution if it is a real problem how can tech solve that <clears throat> that problem in Africa? And is it a CapEx heavy, very expensive uh, process to solve? And 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 how is ShipRaiser using technology to solve these problems? It's a very good question, Sak. And this is, uh, and this is quite, the answer to this is quite different because as we mentioned, Africa with 54 countries, the last mile delivery challenge is different in uh, somewhat similarity, but a lot different in different countries. 
for instance we currently doing business in south africa and kenya extremely like completely different uh the challenges on both sides so i'll be very specific in terms of the challenges we have seen so the challenges in in first of all there is big challenge in both the countries so the solution but also the solution would be fitting based on the kind of challenges are there right so in south africa the challenges are that one some of the common challenges are that the cost to deliver is very high so the average cost to deliver a normal good or less than 1 kg which is your normal d2c kind of brands would be around 4 dollars to 5 dollars which is quite yeah. high compared to if you compare with which is four times then then four to five times which is what you pay in india so and which goes sometimes more than around 10% of your overall apparel cost if you look from the b2b perspective but sometimes in kenya if you really think your if if you're selling t-shirts so sometimes your t-shirt cost and your logistic cost can be 50% of the t-shirt cost like if you're delivering a burger sometimes even on the uber eats if you go in in nairobi and then you will see your your burger cost and your shipping cost for that burger is same uh, so so you know that kind of one big challenge in terms of the rates, the pricing but then how do you really solve the pricing problem without solving the infrastructure problem and that was the main question so the solution for that in south africa is that there are different courier companies who are reached to a level of maturity in terms of their technology technology uh, capabilities so because we can integrate with them we can speak directly to their system we created a rule engine where you can choose uh, you, our platform will give you the option okay for this particular order this should be the option and for this particular order this courier company should be the option so overall we have reduced the logistic cost even with the established for the established pair by 20 to 30 percent so someone yeah. who was paying as an example 10 lakh just for shipping uh right they're now paying seven lakhs or six lakhs they are, that to that level it has been reduced because of the aggregation model and because of the automatic rule shipping rule features which we have built where it not just choose the cheapest but it will also choose the most efficient for that particular order uh, so so that that capability now kenya kenya have di is different beast altogether kenya there is not a single courier company uh, it's extremely fragmented uh, it's extremely like there are small courier companies which are very tiny 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 not a single courier company in both the countries who are really large and big who can do everything really efficiently and uh, from the service point of view but from also costing uh, point of view in kenya it's on a different level there is not a single courier company in kenya right now which have fully fleshed tech system to really track the parcels, update the status, all of that. So now, if you don't have those kind of really large courier companies, then you can't really aggregate to that level, right? So then what we started doing, we started digitizing the fleet in, so we, we what we did is like, okay, if we, if we, so the only solution Kenya lies in is that you build your own courier company, you, you build a DHL there with, with cheaper price, which is not possible, which is heavy capital, extremely capital intensive. Like we are not in that business. We can't own vehicles. We can't own trucks and all of that. But how do we use the fragmented market or the small, small market and then combine all of them? So this is literally what we started doing a few months back in Kenya. It's working very well. So what we did, we spoke to a couple of very small, small uh shipping companies who have network in different cities let's say mubasa nairobi eldoret kisumu nakuru all of these different cities they have their own bike but for the middle there is no one so we we partner with the fleets on those cities we partner with the middle mile we put all together into one our technology platform so for for it it becomes a one courier company but we're utilizing each their strength so technically without still owning any any fleet or having any asset on your cap table, uh, sorry, on your, on your balance sheet, you can still utilize the existing network. So, the, so the, the solution now in Kenya is very different compared to what is South Africa. South Africa is very efficient. You come, you connect your Shopify, you connect your API, thousands of orders comes every day, thousands of orders get shipped. It's more about how do we allocate it? How do we make it more efficient? How do we get the cheaper rates from the best for your companies possible? How do we use uh, the township deliveries where, which is, there's a lot of courier company charge extra search for townships so in south africa the township is like a slums area in in mumbai where delivering in certain slum area can be very costly compared to a normal uh, colony right so 
then we digitize fleas specialized specialize for township deliveries. So now there's no surcharge. So what people used to pay 200 rand, 250 rand, now they're paying on our platform 80 rand, which is like big, big difference. So, so these kind of challenges and, and through getting involved into the operations with those courier companies, helping them, providing the maturity combined with the technology which we are building with Peach Payment, we build a platform, we build a common technology platform in Kenya where people are doing cash on delivery, which is also a big thing in India, right? So in Kenya is also cash on delivery a big thing. So what we started doing, okay, instead of paying cash, you can, you know, pay via M-Pesa, you can pay via card, all of that. So Peach and us, we combined our product to really enable that. So there can be, so there used to be a lot of scams on cash and delivery. So all of that is getting sorted now through our joint technology. Zach, there's a question for you probably here, right? Like maybe if as some, yeah. you know, as you're deeply involved in the venture capital ecosystem across Africa, like and you're looking at investments like Peach and Ship Ship Rocket, and I think it's like 120 other investments that you guys have made, right? Across yeah. the continent. What are the KPIs that you are prioritizing when you're looking at startups? So uh, as you think of, especially around scalability, tech innovation, and with the African lens, right? It's not the same. Yeah. India is one market, 1.4 billion people. There's a different layer of metrics you use. But how do you guys, what metrics are you using to assess these ventures? Yeah, I mean, it's a little, it's um, it's a, a... Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question because managing a Pan-Africa VC fund requires a lot of understanding of local dynamics and uh, demographics. It's not easy. So what typically in in almost all the deals we do, we it's it's very hard to build a unicorn or even a half unicorn in Africa unless you're in more than one market. The only exception being Nigeria, right? Nigeria has 200 and 50 million people and you can build a unicorn in Nigeria, uh, especially if you're on the consumer side. Um, from a VC standpoint, you have to know what metrics help you minimize the cost of acquiring customers. So the cost of acquiring customers in Africa is, is extremely high, especially if you're going direct to consumer. It's not like in India where you can just throw money into Facebook, Google, Meta, et cetera, and acquire customers. You can't do that in Africa at scale because you know even though we've seen a huge increase in internet penetration and mobile it's still not even close to what it should be right when i when i first came to to south africa 14 years ago uh i think the statistic was less than 5% of people were online which is pretty shocking but one of the big reasons for that is because the cost of data was very high when I came to South Africa in 2010, you would pay on average close to $50 for one gig of data, $50 for one gig. Over the last 15 years, that has now gone down to about $2 a gig, roughly, $2 to $2.5 a gig, right? So now you've seen an increasing number of African consumers online, but it's all mobile first, to your point earlier. So when we look at assessing ventures, we we give a lot of um attention to how are you acquiring customers and we have a strong preference for b2b to c businesses so in africa the the big insurance companies the banks the telcos have a borderline very uh what's the word Olig oligo oligopolistic tendencies i mean you know you've got the five big insurance companies in africa you know sunlum momentum discovery Old Mutual, et cetera. You've got five big banks on the continent. So good founders know how to sacrifice a little bit of margin in exchange for volume. And I think Peach does that exceptionally well. And so and, and so does Shipraiser. So we we have a very strong preference for B2B businesses, number one. And number two, um, uh, we look at businesses where they can minimize the customer acquisition costs and maximize customer lifetime value. And for that, you have to know how to work with large corporates. That's the only way. In fact, of the 11 unicorns in Africa today, and by the way, just for our listeners here, although Africa is about 10 years behind India from a tech evolution perspective in the startup sector, we've the time it takes for a company to get to unicorn status is actually quite quite fast. Uh, you know, Flutterwave reached unicorn status in what five years? 
Chipper were something similar, similar, you know, for for Fowry and Andela. So it's um, a big focus of ours is how do you look at acquiring customers in the in the in, in the shortest period of time through partnerships. That is probably the the biggest factor we look at. Um, and then secondly, because capital at the seed stage is a massive problem. Until about four or five years ago, most startups in Africa would would literally spend all their time raising money from angels. So a 10K check here, a 20K check here, and you would spend, I mean, in, in any other market, a company like Peach Payments should not have taken 10 years to do a Series A, right? I mean, now obviously you guys have made it. Your revenues are doing very well. You're in, I think, three or four markets in Africa, but it should not take 10 years, right? So because Africa is so fragmented and the there is a severe shortage of capital, of smart capital at the early stages, entrepreneurs are forced to function like SMEs instead of startups, right? In in uh, in India, for example, if you're building something like a peach payments or a ship razor, there are smart, sophisticated VCs that will back you at the seed stage and raising a million dollars in a seed round is not difficult in India because there is, you know, there are... 60 to 70 similar examples of companies that have done this. So you don't have to educate the market as to why, you know, backing a company at the seed stage makes sense. But in Africa, until about four or five years ago, there wasn't much investment at the seed stage. So you would have to drip feed funding um, and then grow. So if if startups fail because of a lack of product market fit or a lack of problem solution fit, that is perfectly acceptable. But if a startup fails only because they do not have enough capital to keep the business afloat, that is a disgrace. So that is part of the reason why we said, let's focus specifically on seed stage entrepreneurs and founders should not spend more than one or two months of a year of fundraising. Uh, I mean, I, I know Rahul and Sahil, both of you probably at the early days of Peach and, and uh, Shipraiser respectively spent more than half the year raising capital, right? Which which is not which which is bad because you don't it takes away time from your operations and your team right so so yeah that is uh that's broadly speaking how i mean i would say africa is about maybe 10 years behind india and about 5 to 7 years behind latin america and southeast asia but the flip side of that is that valuations in 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 the african tech ecosystem are pretty attractive right um you know i mean without getting into specific numbers i mean in in India, in a in a mature market like India, fintech would easily raise at between fifteen to twenty times ARR, right? Even in a not so bad market, in Africa, it's tough to raise at anything more than um seven, six or seven times ARR, right? But that discrepancy will not last forever. That uh, arbitrage is getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So people investing in te tech in Africa can see pretty significant return uh, potentials if they take on the risk return um, trade-off at the early stage. And I mean, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? Uh, of our 150 plus companies across both funds, we're sitting at an IRR of more than 30%, but it's to a large extent it's driven by the fact that our entry valuations are, are, are quite attractive. So yeah. Um, there was actually, I mean, we, we we don't have much time, but I wanted to ask an important question here to you, Rahul, about, I, I was I was at one of your many talks that you've given about, you know, what do people see in payment service providers, right? People would assume yeah. that the most important thing is pricing or yeah. you know, scalability, but I was actually quite surprised to learn that the, that the number one thing is trust and compliance, right? Yeah. And, and, and things like, things like data security. Can you just, for the sake of our audience, talk about how Peach Payments has leveraged tech like encryption, tokenization, and ML to, to sort of build on that trust layer, which is the most important thing for a payments company versus uh, yeah. price? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, and we we were part of this, you know, research report that we sponsored this year with Worldwide Works, which looked into online retail um, and they've been doing this research for the last 20 years in South Africa. And one of the factors, you know, we one of the questions we asked people was, what do you look for when you, uh, you know, when you think about, when you're picking your payments partner? And I think the number one reason was, number one factor was customer service, and the second was trust, right? 
So, and, and I think both of them are linked to each other, actually. So, you know, processing a payment is only just the first 10% of the work. Like today, what happens is as a consumer, you know, you're already reluctant because of all the challenges and frauds and the friction that you see from a digital payments perspective, especially in some of these nascent markets, that trust becomes the number one factor convincing a consumer to use your digital channels. And, you know, so one of the things we realized with Peach, a couple of things we did strategically over the past few years, one was, you know, in the early days, at least for large enterprise clients, you know, we understand that the trust of the consumer is with that brand. So let's say if you're yeah. a large, if you're, um, you know, big telco or a mobile network in South Africa, then I don't need to lend our brand and credibility into that because you as a consumer, that will already trust and believe in this brand so we built products you know when we started peach it was we were very enterprise focused so all our products were very behind the scenes it was never pushing peach's brand um yeah. to the forefront because we didn't want to disrupt that experience for the user as they were transacting or engaging with a particular brand or one of our merchants as we started venturing into the sme space we realized that actually those smes don't have that brand credibility or that um, inherent trust with that consumer. So in those cases, we had to become more in the forefront and lend our brand to the transaction experience so that people trust and say, okay, you know what, there will Peach. Yeah, I know Peach, I've used Peach before and therefore it might be okay to transact with this business. So we've seen that trust being a very critical factor. And obviously, you know, today we have 12 years of experience and uh, demonstrated uh, credibility that we've built with those users the other big thing yeah. we've started doing actively say, over the last two years is we started advertising and we started building peach as a brand a lot more so you know we we participated and we sponsored the joburg super kings uh, we'll continue to partner with them this year as well and so getting more our our brand out there really to build that b2b2c Trust. We are not a consumer-facing business. Actually, we don't offer a single product or service that we sell directly to a consumer. We only sell to businesses who then sell to consumers. But for that consumer to trust that entire experience, they need to know who we are. They need to understand that, hey, if you pay with Peach, it's safe, it's secure, we've got the best security standards in place, we are fully certified, et cetera, et cetera. So I think for us, trust became a big aspect and then, as I said, number one was customer service. And that's really what drove Peach's growth was just delivering good customer service to businesses. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things to scale because it, there's a lot of human element. But really, we're starting to look at how do we simplify our product? How do we build products that don't break so you don't need customer service? How do you scale, use AI and some of these you know, new, new tools that have become available to scale a high quality of customer service. And I think that's something we continue to be on a journey for. You know, it was easier to do it when you had 20 customers, you could give everyone one-on-one -on -one attention. When you have yeah. thousands, yeah. you have to scale customer service and maintain your quality of service. And I think that's not an easy task. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, I think we could go on for at least another hour, but I believe we are we are past the ten o'clock mark. So I'm going to pass it on to Nisha or anyone else here um, uh, in in terms of closing remarks. But this has been such an insightful conversation with two with two titans, if I may, of the industry here in South Africa. So thank you very much, Rahul and Sahil, for your time. Um, over to you, Nisha. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. And it was such an easy flow of discussion. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed. And there's a lot for you people, I guess, the next year is going to be the G20 presidency in um, Australia, uh, Africa. And uh, we're going to see a lot of people like you there. We're going to be a part of it. Thank you with this good note. Pleasure being with you. <laughs>